Let me just comment first of all on the fact that uh, hard as it is to believe now, this is what passed for news last week. As many of you have been briefed, we provided additional information today about uh, the site of my birth. We do not have time for this kind of silliness. We got better stuff to do. Better stuff indeed. At this very moment, the biggest and most costly manhunt in U.S. history is building to a crescendo. The target, Osama bin Laden. This is something that uh, we've been after for uh, 15 years. Uh, it goes back before 9-11. What would become known as Operation Neptune Spear began last July, when after years of painstaking intelligence gathering, a CIA operative spotted bin Laden's trusted courier, a man known as Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, in Peshawar, Pakistan. By August, he's been traced back to this large compound in the tourist town of Abbottabad, where he's living with his brother and their respective families. The compound has few outward-facing windows and high walls topped with electrified barbed wire. They had implemented some uh, very heavy security measures. The president is first briefed on the compound that same month. Throughout the fall, aggressive surveillance from the sky and from a nearby CIA safe house determines that another family is living there too, on the second and third floors of the main structure. The family fits the profile of the bin Ladens. Suspiciously, they're burning their own trash. And a tall man, referred to as the pacer by the spies, is seen walking in the courtyard. But it was all circumstantial. Uh, we never had direct evidence that he, in fact, had ever been there or was located there. Over the winter, the CIA's confidence in the target grows. In February, Director Leon Panetta meets with Vice Admiral William McRaven, head of Joint Special Operations Command, and tells him to prepare a mission plan. As winter turns to spring, the president chairs no less than five super secret national security meetings on this topic. On March 14th, the option of a remote airstrike with B-2 bombers is offered and rejected. The president wants proof positive of bin Laden's death, not just a hole in the ground. If the operation is a go, it will be handled by the so-called silent option, the Navy SEALs. In April, units from SEAL Team 6 start training for the operation stateside using a mock-up of the compound to familiarize themselves with its every structure, wall, and entrance. They deploy for a staging base in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, late that month. The individuals who carried out this assault planned for all the various contingencies. Last Thursday, 4.30 p.m., the president tells his national security team he'll make a decision soon, but he needs more time to think and there's plenty to think about. The president has committed the American military to a third conflict, this one in Libya. Now is not the time for a high profile fiasco and the memories of prior failures, the botched rescue of the Iranian hostages in 1980, the Black Hawk Down disaster in Somalia in 1993, haunt the Situation Room. And just as troubling, the blown opportunity in 2001 to kill bin Laden in the caves of Tora Bora. We had the best intelligence case that we ever had on bin Laden since Tora Bora. Friday morning, 8.20 a.m., while billions of people are consumed by the spectacle of the royal wedding, <laughs> President Obama meets again with his national security team and tells them it's a go. Immediately after green lighting the operation, the president flies to Alabama to tour the storm damage, while in Jalalabad, the SEAL team makes their final preparation. Saturday, the president calls Vice Admiral McRaven, himself a former SEAL, and tells him, it's in your hands, friend. But the operation is delayed. The weather's not right. In Jalalabad, the SEAL team goes through their checklist once again as they wait for the signal. 
The people of Pakistan and its military are blithely unaware of what's in the works. The biggest story of the day is a victory by the national cricket team. And West Indies 14 for one. And in the States, the news is equally right. People think bin Laden is hiding in the Hindu Kush, but did you know that every day from 4 to 5 he hosts a show on C-SPAN? <laughs> Saturday night is the White House Correspondents Dinner. I sit next to Admiral Mike Mullen, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's all small talk. You'd never know what was going on. While President Obama does some Oscar-worthy acting himself. My fellow Americans, <laughs> mahalo. It is wonderful to be here at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. What a week. But behind the scenes, in the Situation Room, White House staffers and the military are beginning to gather. Sunday morning, Director Panetta goes to church. The president takes in nine holes of golf. By 1 p.m., the national security staff is now gathered in the Situation Room hooked into a live video feed from CIA headquarters. We had set up a, uh, an operations post here at the uh, CIA, and uh, I was in direct communication with Admiral McRaven, who was located uh, in Afghanistan. 2.05 p.m., 11.05 in Abbottabad. The operation is code green, and the Navy SEALs, the silent option, are slipping over the base of the Himalayas with public enemy number one in their crosshairs. Take elements from every spy movie, thriller, and action adventure you have ever seen, and you have the reality of this operation. The raid itself was beyond daring, but what preceded it was months of painstaking, secretive, and dangerous CIA work. In addition to the surveillance and satellites above, we have now learned there was a secret safe house right in Abbottabad with CIA spies inside. The house was likely far from the bin Laden compound so as not to raise suspicions. Elevation was important as well, given those high walls around the compound and the third floor where bin Laden was living. CIA Director Leon Panetta will not confirm there were spies on the ground, but clearly this information did not come from overhead satellites. We could see uh, clothes and we could see uh, some of the members of the family on that third floor. One-way reflective glass helped hide the spies and their equipment. Portable cameras were likely used as well. And we have a variety of uh, surveillance equipment that we can hide uh, that you can do it through a vehicle with tinted windows. You can do it through um, cameras that you leave behind and you, and you replace every so often. Something you might leave outside disguised as a rock or, you know, just a piece of litter or trash. We now know that the CIA spies were tracking a taller man in the courtyard who took regular walks. They referred to him as the pacer, but could never get a clear enough shot to determine if it was indeed bin Laden. Bin Laden himself was smart enough to stay off cell phones, away from the windows, and did not talk in the courtyard. So there was never any positive ID before the raid. But the number of family living up there matched the number in bin Laden's. Pacer was taller, trash was burned, high walls. That was enough circumstantial evidence from the surveillance to make the mission a go. Intelligence analysts are only now scratching the surface of the mountains of evidence seized by Navy SEALs inside bin Laden's compound. But key details have begun to emerge about just how operationally involved in Al-Qaeda bin Laden continued to be and how intent the terror network was on developing new strategies to attack America. Among the targets, big cities like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago and Washington. What I see here, at least for now, is that bin Laden, the engineer who wants to look at the structure of possible attack targets, was asking questions and was getting information. Officials say a handwritten notebook was found at the compound with discussions of a plan to derail American passenger trains, prompting this Homeland Security bulletin. As of February 2010, Al-Qaeda was looking into trying to tip a train by tampering with the rails so that the train would fall off the track at either a valley or a bridge. 
Additional materials found contain information about other infrastructure targets, such as dams and the water supply, as well as information about al-Qaeda safe houses and al-Qaeda leaders. And for the first time today, a look behind the scenes on that tense Sunday for President Obama as the White House released video of the president congratulating his team after bin Laden was killed. You guys did a great job. They did. With each new detail about the complexity of the over 10-year-long American-led hunt for bin Laden emerge, a clearer picture has begun to take shape about just how much one man has cost this country, not just in lives, but in money, taking into consideration everything from the economic toll of the September 11th attacks to the heightened security put in place over the last 10 years to the new programs developed to prevent further attacks to the two wars being waged in Afghanistan and Iraq, to the actual direct physical hunt for bin Laden, some are placing the cost anywhere between $250 billion to a staggering $3 trillion. And while many, including the president, have indicated that this does not mean an end to the so-called war on terror, with one of the key players dead, things are bound to change. Today, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates spoke about the death of bin Laden while touring a military base in North Carolina. In terms of uh, the situation in Afghanistan, uh, I think that uh, there is a possibility that it uh, could be a game changer. How the game changes, of course, remains to be seen.